Severe drought can be a scary, consequential thing. The past two years, I have taken a couple long road trips out west, from the Canadian Rockies to the Grand Canyon. The ever-changing landscape is incredible, and pictures will never do it justice. As insane as the Rockies are to experience for the first time, I found the dry area directly to the east to be even more intriguing. These are the short grass prairies of the High Plains. From Grasslands National Park in Saskatchewan, the Terry Badlands in Montana, to the Pawnee National Grassland in Colorado, all the way through eastern New Mexico, the area is, by definition, the rain shadow of the Rocky Mountains. But that doesn't mean it's lifeless. Prairie dogs, bison, elk, lizards, snakes, and spiders thrive in this area, with a climate that would make human settlement very uncomfortable. 110 degree summers, 20 degree winters, and high winds year-round batter the barren landscape, slowly eroding the exposed soil. When the sand and soil gets blown into the air, this can create dust storms that sweep across the region, and none were worse than the Dust Bowl storms of the 1930s. Nicknamed Black Blizzards and occurring amidst the Great Depression, the Dust Bowl storms were a plague of biblical proportions, a never-ending barrage on the people in the High Plains. Years of severe drought, improper farming techniques, and strong cold fronts moved billions of tons of dirt across the entire Midwest, clouding the skies of Chicago, Cleveland, and New York, and buried the once prosperous wheat farms in the shortgrass prairies. Today, we'll analyze the atmospheric circulation that caused excessive rain in the 1920s and drought just a decade later, explore how farming on the prairies can affect the atmosphere directly above, and marvel at the sheer magnitude and intensity of the worst dust storms to ever affect the United States. Let's dive in. I feel that one of the most frustrating aspects of meteorology is the way the media covers it. Honest, unbiased, factual journalism was the only way people on the East Coast were able to learn just how dire the situation was in the Dust Bowl. But today, the mainstream media is anything but unbiased. From prioritizing dramatic headlines to sensationalizing important issues, today's news is optimized for the algorithm that delivers it to us on our phones, computers, and social media. But Ground News is an app and website that solves this problem. Founded by a former NASA engineer as a more objective way to stay informed, it gathers related news from around the world, allowing readers to compare coverage for a deeper understanding of today's current events. Have you heard about a new study on the Atlantic Meridional overturning circulation and how it might collapse? Notice all these sensational headlines? Let's compare them. Ground News found 45 sources reporting on the story, and it's easy to tell from the bias distribution feature that most of the sources are centrist. 60% are highly factual, and 22% of the sources are owned by independent news companies, getting right to the heart of the matter. I can't emphasize how important this is when it comes to science, and Ground News makes it effortless to find credible sources and diverse perspectives you wouldn't otherwise see. If you're like me and want to think more critically about today's world, Ground News is offering Weatherbox viewers 40% off their Vantage plan, unlocking unlimited access to all their fantastic features. Go to groundnews.com forward slash Weatherbox to check them out today. Coming from a science nerd like myself, you won't regret it. The climatology of the Great Plains depends on both longitude and latitude. Temperature is more dependent on latitude. Texas is much warmer in the winter than Alberta. But precipitation is more dependent on longitude. The closer to the Rocky Mountains you are, the less precipitation you'll receive. You'll notice that the precipitation gradient is much tighter in Texas than it is in North Dakota, and this is because the main source of moisture for the U.S. east of the Rocky Mountains is the Gulf of Mexico. In the far eastern plains, you can see about 26 inches of rainfall annually, but in the far western regions, you can see less than than 10. Now, the prairies themselves used to extend as far east as Indiana. These were known as the tall grass prairies. As the glaciers that once carved a path through the U.S. retreated, rocky sediment was deposited across the region called till. Over hundreds of years, organic matter deposited upon the till, creating topsoil. From there, tundra vegetation grew, then spruce forest, and then fires. Changing climates and grazing destroyed these forests, allowing the prairies to form. Blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, and a plethora of aster dominated 240 million acres of the Midwest, 
And then the Europeans came. In 1837, John Deere himself invented the steel plow, and by 1998% of the tall grass prairies were turned into farmland. And it makes sense. The soil beneath the tall grass was rich, the land was comparatively flat, and the area received 30 to 40 inches of rain a year. The vast majority of this land today is cornfields. A high yield corn crop will take about 25 inches of moisture per year, and that moisture must fall between April and September. Today, the few tall grass prairies that remain are often overlooked areas. Hilly river bluffs, cemeteries, small strips along interstates 80 and 90, and thankfully, a few few protected wildlife areas. To the west exists the mixed grass prairie, which is a transitional zone between the tall and short grasses. These prairies are the most diverse of the Great Plains. Different grasses, shrubs, and trees grow in this central third. Low-lying areas that collect rainwater can support the taller grasses and deciduous trees, such as cottonwoods and junipers. But the higher areas see more wind, which increases soil moisture evaporation, favoring shorter grasses. One of the most visited mixed prairie biomes in the United States is that surrounding Badlands National Park. Although receiving significantly less precipitation than areas areas to the east, the fertile soil can still support winter and spring wheat, barley, sunflowers, and corn if irrigated properly. Finally, to the west sits the High Plains, composed of a short grass prairie. With much of it sitting at over 2,000 feet in elevation, it contains many interesting geographic landforms, such as the Terry Badlands in Montana, Thunder Basin in Wyoming, Comanche in Colorado, and Rita Blanca National Grasslands in Texas. Southern Alberta receives an average of 12 inches of precipitation a year, while Central Texas receives just over 20. The region is blanketed with buffalo grass and blue grama, which are hardy and can survive severe droughts. This is where the vast majority of wheat in North America is produced. Needing only 12 to 15 inches of water per growing season, it's well suited for the average climate of the high plains, the key word being average, because really year to year, or really day-to-day -day weather in the high plains is intense and unpredictable. The world record for the greatest temperature change in 24 hours occurred in Browning, Montana on January 23, 1916. A continental polar air mass careened down from the Arctic, causing temperatures to fall from 44 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 56. Not only do the Rocky Mountains cause a rain shadow, they also block this cold polar air from moving further westward, accelerating it southeast down the spine of the high plains. One of the biggest influencers of long-term continental climate in the high plains is sea surface temperatures in both the Atlantic and the Pacific. Ocean temperatures and weather patterns are intertwined in this dance of call and response. Sea surface temperatures like El Nino and La Nina can affect the general placement of larger air masses, as well as influence the pattern of the jet stream. When this jet stream dives down across the central United States, it often means rain. Let's take a look at sea surface temperature anomalies in both the Atlantic and Pacific during some of the hottest summers in the central United States. Research performed by Marcus Donat, Andrew King, Jonathan Overpeck, Lisa Alexander, Imke Durr, and David Carolee used past surface observations to find the hottest and driest summers over the central U.S. and attempted to recreate these hot conditions using the 20th century reanalysis weather model. Looking at the data, four years stood out amongst the rest, 1934, 1936, 2011, and 2012. Now let's also take a look at sea surface temperature and mean sea level pressure anomalies for those years as well. That's interesting. All of these years share one anomaly in common, unusually warm waters over the northern Atlantic. This is the Atlantic subtropical high, and it deviated much further north than what is usually observed in the summer months. However, the temperatures in the Pacific are a different story. In the 1930s, the North Pacific was warm and the Central Pacific was cold. But in the 20-teens, the Central Pacific was warm and the North Pacific was cold. You can clearly see how the temperature of the ocean affects these air masses that sit directly above it, and in turn affect the jet stream. Now, when we're talking about precipitation over the central US, we should look at the mean wind at 850 millibars over the course of spring and summer. 850 millibars is about 5,000 feet, and it represents the top of the boundary layer, or the layer where air interacts with the land and ocean below. During exceptionally dry years over the central US, we would expect to see weakened 850 millibar flow up from the Gulf of Mexico. 
And wouldn't you know it, the southerly flow was non-existent in 1934 and 1936, severely weakened in 2011, and surprisingly strong in 2012. The hot summers of 2011 and 2012 weren't that unbearable in the grand scheme of things. The biggest tragedy that happened during that period is the spring of 2011 tornado outbreaks that killed hundreds in the deep south. But the 1930s were a completely different story. And to explain it, we need to take a step outside of meteorology for a moment. In the late 1910s and early 1920s, wheat farming became prosperous in the High Plains. Unusually wet years and lowland prices set by the Homestead Act meant farmers could stake claim to 160 acres, build a home, strip the land of short grass prairies, and plant as much wheat as they could fit. As the demand for wheat products grew back east due to World War I, the number of wheat farms increased. The steel plow made churning the soil that much more efficient, and the harvest in the late 1920s were the largest the country had ever seen. Due to the low cost of entry and high profit potential, investors began buying lots sight unseen. And then the Great Depression hit. Wheat prices began slowly dropping year after year, but many of the farmers viewed the depression as something that was contained to the East Coast. A problem for city folk. It was just business as usual in the Great Frontier. Until it wasn't. You see, throughout the Roaring Twenties, temperatures were slowly increasing in the North Atlantic. Between 1920 and 1930, every surface observation station recorded warmer temperatures than the year prior. And while it took the atmosphere a long time to respond to this large-scale change, it finally happened in 1932, and the timing couldn't have been worse. On January 21st, a strong surface low with associated cold front pushed its way eastward from Colorado to Iowa. 60 mile an hour wind gusts along the frontal boundary raced across the high plains, gaining speed due to the lack of friction from buildings and trees. And here is where the human aspect of this disaster comes into play. Grass is very important in the plains. Although it seems like a thin, fragile plant that can break and bend in the wind, the root systems that these grasses create tap deep into the soil, holding it together and keeping it from eroding away in the wind. When farmers across the southern high plains used the steel disc plow on these prairies, the root systems were effectively torn apart and now loose dirt and sand were exposed to these high winds. And although the smaller dust storms were common on particularly dry and windy days, this one was different. A wall of dust nearly 10,000 feet high swept across the region from Pueblo through Amarillo, blocking out the sun. The Weather Bureau, remember this is pre-NOAA, didn't understand exactly what had caused this large-scale event, but they began to observe that the winter and spring of 1932 were unusually dry. Now, if this was post-World War I, we could easily obtain upper air data and analyze the position of the jet stream in 1932. But launching weather balloons with radiosondes at regular intervals wasn't a common practice until the end of the 1930s, so upper air data is scarce. Thankfully, in 2010, scientists from across the globe created the Comprehensive Historical Upper Air Network, collecting upper air data between 1920 and 1957, and calculating monthly averages of geopotential height and temperature at the 850 through 100 millibar levels. Now, the resolution is pretty low, but in the summer months, we can see a clear ridge over the central US at the 500 millibar level, which does support the influence of the anomalous sea surface temperatures on the jet stream. As the lack of rain continued into the summer and it became clear that a sudden drought was now underway, the Weather Bureau began classifying these dust storms by severity. The worst dust storms reduced visibility to less than a quarter mile, of which there were 14 in a single year. Now, the mechanisms behind the dust storm were simple. Strong cold fronts on the backside of mid-latitude cyclones that roared across the flat terrain of the high plains. Because of this, it would often be sunny or partly cloudy, with a wall of dust looming over the horizon hundreds of miles away. Even when moving at 60 miles an hour, the dust storm could take several hours to make it to your area. But once it hit, you had to move indoors. The fine sand got in your eyes, ears, nose, and mouth and could create blisters on your skin. 
It would find its way through the cracks in your doors and windowsills, piling up on beds and kitchen tables. Many onlookers described the dust cloud as rolling horizontally, and this is due to horizontal vorticity. Because the cold fronts are wedge-shaped, the inherent change in wind speed with height produces a spinning horizontal tube of air in which the dust can rotate. The black and white film images taken of these dust storms show the rolling cloud from the vantage points of tall buildings in the center of Dust Bowl towns, like Elkhart, Kansas. In March of 1933, western Oklahoma saw no rain at all, which is well below the average of an inch. 38 severe dust storms swept across the high plains that year, and with it it brought a new phenomenon, electrostatic shocks. Much like a regular thunderstorm, individual dust particles could become polarized once airborne, and due to the high density of the particles in the air, electrostatic charges on the magnitude of hundreds of thousands of volts were easily achieved. People would attach chains to the backs of their vehicles to ground them. Hugs and handshakes could result in shocks that knocked people off their feet. 1934 was even worse. The sea surface temperature in the North Atlantic had now peaked, imposing a pattern of long-term drought. The worst part of the drought was, unironically, the times that it did rain. In the spring of 1934, a low-pressure system did bring significant rain and snow for one day. The people of the plains were so elated and they believed that the drought was over, only for it to not happen again. In May, the strongest ridge of the decade built northward over the high plains. Daytime temperatures reached over 100 in North Dakota and nearing 120 in Nebraska. This ridge that early in the year paved way for one of the most infamous dust storms of all time, one that would bring nationwide attention to the high plains. On May 9th, a strong surface low dove down from Alberta with a strong cold front diving down over the high plains and racing east. Tens of millions of pounds of dust was launched into the atmosphere and carried across the Midwest, blocking the sun in Chicago, Cleveland, Detroit, and New York. Ironically, dust blew into the White House during a press conference held by FDR regarding the drought in the High Plains. Up until that point, everyone on the East Coast believed that the homesteaders on the prairie were so far away that anything that affected them climate-wise was not going to make its way back to the big cities. And really, why would it? Everybody in New York, Chicago, and DC were busy dealing with the greatest financial crisis this country had ever seen. It's not like they were farmers depending on rain for their livelihood. But a few inches of Nebraska dust on that day changed that mindset forever. And boy, those big city folk had some big ideas on how to solve the problem. It was pretty clear that the main cause of these dust storms was from the overturning of soil due to the steel plow. That's how this dust was able to get blown so far. So, a concrete company proposed covering the farmland with concrete, but leaving small holes for the wheat to sprout. You also had steel manufacturers who wanted to lay chicken wire over the farms to try and contain the dust to the ground. City folk had no idea how large the high plains were, but the race to come up with a solution drove many workers to think outside the box. Through a plan signed into law by FDR, residents of the southern high plains received over 50 tons of food and 30 tons of coal, much of which was not accepted by prideful farmers who were willing to die by the fruit of their land or lack thereof. But eventually, conditions got so dire that most families accepted government assistance. In 1935 alone, 850 million tons of soil and dust were blown off of farmland in the High Plains. The government thought that maybe settlement was a mistake and pulling people out of the High Plains might be the best option. However, soil scientist Howard Fennell had begun to experiment with new farming techniques centered around retaining as much soil moisture as possible. He believed that contour plowing, or plowing across a field following its elevation contour lines would prevent further erosion of the soil. As Fennell trekked across the high plains to spread his method of farming, he found that many farmers had left for California, loading up their belongings and families in a car, and leaving without a trace. These Oklahomans and Texans became migrant workers and were met with scrutiny and paid very little. Photographers like Dorothea Lang captured famous photographs of these families depicting their strife away from home. As the sea surface temperatures regressed back to the mean, 
The drought began to end in the High Plains. 1938 and 1939 saw significantly more rain and less dust storms, due in part to a mass adoption of terracing as a farming technique. In a model created by Benjamin Cook, Ron Miller, and Richard Seeger, it was shown that the inclusion of forcing mechanisms from human land degradation in the High Plains was a large contributing factor in the record-setting high temperatures. When only including sea surface temperature anomalies, the temperature anomaly shifted much further further southwest. This explains why conditions improved by nearly 80% by 1940. The government had another tool up its sleeve too, trees. In the heart of the Depression, the Civilian Conservation Corp put young men to work by planting 250 million trees in Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, and South Dakota to create a wind-breaking wall to help protect farmers from dust storms. Today, much of the land beneath North America's breadbasket is being irrigated by aquifers such as the Ogallala Aquifer. This means that the crop yields from year to year are much more reliable and consistent than they would be if you just relied on rain. The aquifer supports about 30 $35 billion in crop production every year, but the water doesn't get replenished quickly and is slowly running out. Many scientists estimate that the aquifers beneath the high plains have between 50 and 100 years worth of water left if they are continued to be pumped at the current rate. So another dust bowl, or at least a period of intense high plains drought and dust storms, could very well happen again if we don't manage to land properly. I hope you guys enjoyed this look into the worst drought in United States history and learned about a concrete example of how humans can influence the climate of an area locally for a set period of time. If you notice I'm wearing my Asheville shirt today in honor of those who were affected by the torrential rains in the Southern Appalachians from Hurricane Helene, I left a couple links in the description below where you can donate to help the victims. I did, hope you guys donate. And if you're affected by Hurricane Helene, my thoughts and prayers are with you. I hope you get the assistance that you need. I'll see you guys soon.